We are ready to start the afternoon session, and we will do that with a pair of fireside chats with CEA's own CEO, Will McCaskill, and two leaders in their field, starting off with Professor Philip Tetlock. He is the Annenberg University professor at the University of Pennsylvania and the author of several books that combine ideas from psychology, political science, and organizational behavior. To name just two, in 2005, he published Expert Political Judgment. How good is it? And as you, spoiler, might have guessed, he demonstrated that the so-called experts, often trotted out and quoted by the media, are very often wrong, but not so often held accountable. Later, in 2015, he published Super Forecasting, The Art and Science of Prediction. In this book, he summarizes the results of a project in which everyday intelligent people work together to predict future outcomes. Surprisingly, their accuracy often beat that of the U.S. intelligence community. The Wall Street Journal has called Super Forecasting the most important book on decision-making since Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, and economist Tyler Cowen has called Professor Tetlock one of the most important social scientists working today. Please welcome for a fireside chat with Will McGaskill, Professor Philip Tetlock. Hi, Phil. Can you hear us okay? I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's perfect. Thanks so much for getting to Skype in. Shame we can't have you in person, but it's great to be able to see your face. Well, it's my apologies. A family medical issue prevented it. No worries at all. So for those of you who um, don't know in the audience, uh, can you, Phil, tell us um, just an overview of your work on both um, expert political judgment and more recent work on uh, super forecasting? Well, um, I've been uh, exploring forecasting tournaments for a long time. I'm going to reveal how old I am when I tell you how long I've been doing it. I, I started doing it shortly after I got tenure at Berkeley, and that was in 1984, and Mikhail Gorbachev hadn't become General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union yet. Um, uh, the work that I did in the 80s and the 90s culminated in the publication of Expert Political Judgment, How Good Is It? How Can We Know? Uh, which was mentioned earlier. Um, and then the later work... Uh, uh, on super forecasting was the result of a, a series of forecasting tournaments sponsored by uh, the U.S. intelligence community. And I think one of your panel members, uh, Jason Matheny, was a key instrumental person in making all of that happen. Um, I, I tend to think of the two different phases of work as uh, the more negative and the more positive. Um, the expert political judgment work was more about cursing the darkness and documenting just exactly how deeply biased we are. Uh, whereas the work on super forecasting had a more upbeat tone, it was more meliorist in a sense of uh, focusing on ways we could improve human judgment uh, by identifying better forecasters, by training them, by putting them in constructive teams, and by uh, developing algorithms that synthesize the wisdom of the crowd. Terrific. And so, well, one thing is in terms of putting 1984 in context, that was three years before I was born, so I don't want to make you feel too old. But, um, <laughs> So, yeah, tell me, what did you find about expert political judgment then? Were these experts very good at predicting the future? No. <laughs> Not very good. I think that one of the key findings of expert political judgment was that expert self-concepts are out of alignment with reality. Uh, their subjective probabilities of, uh, of, of uh, possible futures were uh, systematically higher than the objective frequency with which events Occurred. When they said there was an 80% likelihood of something happening, those things often happened, say, 60% of the time, uh, sometimes less. Now, not all experts were equally badly calibrated. Uh, some experts were better calibrated, and uh, that those patterns of individual differences were one of the stimuli, I think, that led um, IARPA to be interested in uh, sponsoring forecasting tournaments. Mm. It might be, it, it, they held at least a hint that it might be possible uh, to, to get better at this. Interesting. So, yeah, expand a little bit more on kind of why this whole project is so important. Um, why might it be the case that IARPA would be interested in um, wanting to find the people who are best at forecasting, you know, these major events? Well, you'd be better off asking Jason exactly why IARPA might have been interested in doing this. He, he, he would have a lot more insider knowledge than I would. I, I could offer you some theoretical speculation as to why I think the intelligence community might have been open to doing something like that. They recently suffered um, 
some high profile uh, public failures, uh, and in particular the Iraq WMD event. Um, but I think there, there's been a long-standing interest in um, the, the question of how good is it possible to make probability estimates, um, but, uh, and, but, and also a recognition that there are a lot of organizational and political factors that make people reluctant to explore that possibility. Um, when people make forecasts in the political and business world, they often have, and I think in the philanthropic world as well, uh, they often, often have uh, more objectives in mind than accuracy. Uh, they want to signal loyalty to their political tribe. Uh, they want to position themselves so they can't be blamed. Uh, I mean, imagine if you are um, an intelligence analyst and someone asks you how likely is it that the Russians are going to take make a move on Estonia in the next year, and you can say you can make you can hold your, you can make yourself reasonably politically safe by saying by retreating into vague verbiage forecasting and saying something along the lines of well I think it's a distinct possibility they'll move into Estonia and distinct possibility when you ask uh, naive readers to translate that could mean anything from about twenty to eighty percent so if it happens you can say hey I told you distinct possibility and if it doesn't happen you can say hey I just said it was possible um, so. Uh, there's a certain reluctance, I think, to explore how precise it's possible to become in probability estimation. Um, I think vague verbiage forecasting keeps us safe, uh, but it also pretty much makes it impossible to learn to become better calibrated. Yeah, well, that just makes it all the more impressive that IARPA were willing to do that because, you know, running the test that could make themselves, you know, actually could be quite embarrassing for them. Uh, and on that note, can you tell us a little bit about the tournament they ran then and what the Good Judgment Project was and how it did compared to, uh, in, in terms of forecasting these events, compared to the IARPA standards that they were recommending? Well, IARPA set up a number of standards for judging uh, the participants. Uh, there were five different uh, academic research teams at the beginning that were competing against each other. And um, it also set some absolute benchmarks as, rel as well as relativistic benchmarks. Uh, it, it created a control group and it said, look, if you can beat the unweighted average of the control group by, I think, 20% in the first year and 30% the next year and 40% the year after that, you're doing reasonably well. Um, and the Good Judgment Project was successful in beating those benchmarks by a substantial margin very early on. Um, and the other teams were not, so they decided to um, concentrate resources after the second year. Terrific. And so what was it that made the Good Judgment Project so good at forecasting, so much better than these other teams? How did you go about selecting people and so on? Um, I'm not sure that our forecasting pool was all that much better than the control group. I think it was a little bit better than the control group, which was a bit of a, an interesting methodological issue we could talk about if we had <laughs> an hour or two. Uh, but I, I think the major drivers of performance uh, of the Good Judgment Project were um, the uh, selection and retention of super forecasters. The, the, the top people who uh, resisted regression toward the mean over time, um, the uh, efficacy of the training technique uh, that we developed for, for cognitive debiasing, uh, the nature of the teamwork that we we're able to encourage, and the, um, and, and the algorithms that um, our statisticians were, were able to develop. Mm. So tell us a little bit about um, what these traits of the super forecasters were. So when you were looking at the pool and you're selecting the best people, um, what sort of things were the habits or um, techniques that they used that meant they were better at predicting events than other people? Well, uh, I mean, some of the things that distinguish super forecasters from ordinary mortals uh, are, are not all that surprising. They, they tend to be a bit, a bit smarter, they score higher on fluid intelligence, they tend to be more actively open-minded, um, and they tend to be, make more effort to be granular in their assessments of uncertainty. That they, they use more points along the probability scale from zero to one. Um, in addition to that, I think perhaps the most important thing that distinguishes um, the super forecasters from many other people is that they think that forecasting real-world events is a skill that can be cultivated and is worth cultivating. 
and they're willing to give it a shot. If you believe that, look, there's no way you can possibly estimate the probability of something like whether Greece is going to leave the Eurozone or how the, how the Brexit referendum would work out or what Russia is going to do in Estonia, if you believe that these are essentially unique, one-off historical events that it's impossible to estimate probabilistically, you're not going to put much cognitive effort into estimating them, uh, and you're not going to get any better at it. Uh, so you need to be willing to make a cognitive leap of faith, as it were, that this is a skill that can be cultivated and is worth cultivating. And yeah, so and you mentioned that with saying engaging in these cognitive debiasing techniques. Um, I think there's a lot of people in the audience who are very interested in trying to debias themselves, but quite a spotty history of the ability to do that within psychology. What were the techniques that uh, the super forecasters used to make themselves better? Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> uh, that 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 that's really crucial. Uh, um, uh, they, 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 they did a lot of things. In the super forecasting book, we summarize them at the end, uh, the, ten, the Ten Commandments for Aspiring Super Forecasters. Um, we tried to condense some of the best principles, best practices into some of the training modules. Um, and there were a couple of things we did that I think were different from uh, modal practices in the research literature. Uh, and one of them was this, this principle of error balancing and debiasing. It is true that, on average, if you had to bet, uh, people are more likely to be overconfident than underconfident on the types of questions that were being posed in the IARPA tournament. Uh, but underconfidence is also a possible error. And it, it's relatively easy uh, to you know, kind of hammer at people and say, hey, don't be overconfident. Uh, but if that simply causes them to be indiscriminately underconfident, you haven't improved aggregate calibration. Uh, so you need to alert people to the nature of the offsetting biases that exist in various situations, uh, balancing under and over confidence. Another um, pretty good bet is that on average people um, tend to be somewhat rigid uh, and, and resist um, modifying their preconceptions. Uh, that's no, no, no surprise in the political season. Um, but um, uh, there's also the flip side error. People are sometimes excessively volatile and overreact to news. Uh, so er the principle of error balancing is one that I think serves super forecasters quite well. They tend to be quite conscious of it, um, and uh, I think it worked. I, I don't think the, 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 the training uh, protocols produce the largest percentage improvement in accuracy in the work we did, mm -hmm. but you have to consider that the, the training we the implement only lasted about an hour, and the improvements extended throughout the forecasting year, which I regarded as nothing short of a miracle. Wow, it's an only an hour worth of training produced that long-lasting benefit. I think it's good. Yeah, it's, it's certainly for me. Uh, you know, I was surprised by uh, several aspects of the forecasting tournament. I was surprised by the magnitude of the improvement it was possible to get. I was surprised by, um, by the elite group and how much better they were, how consistently better they were. Uh, I was surprised by the amount of bang we could get from a pretty minimalist training intervention. Uh, I was surprised by the fact that teamwork worked um, as well. Because um, as you know, you know, teams can be prone to groupthink and cognitive and social loafing and all, all sorts of group group dynamic biases. Yeah. Well. So uh, it. Yeah. As the yeah, final part ahead. of this puzzle, then tell us how you did the judgment aggregation across different people, because um, that's the kind of final step. You've got all these great forecasters, and they've self improved as well through training. But then you also just need to aggregate all their judgments. And what was the method that right. Good Judgment Project used there? Right. Um, well, the, the, the example I used in, in the super forecasting book, it, it comes from uh, the movie Zero Dark Thirty, in which you have the inimitable James Gandolfini playing Leon Panetta, and he's got a bunch of advisors around the room, and he's asking them, how likely is it that Osama bin Laden is residing in a compound in Nevadabad? And um, I asked people to do a little thought experiment and imagine that each person around the table gives the director the answer 0. 0.7. They say 0. 0.7, 0. 0.7, 0. 0.7. They say, so what should the director conclude is the probability that Osama is in the compound, and most people kind of roll their eyes and say, well, it's kind of obvious, it's 0.7, but it's not quite that obvious because it, it depends. It depends on whether the people around the table are clones of each other. If they're clones of each other, uh, the answer is indeed 0.7. If they're drawing on exactly the same information, processing it in exactly the same ways, uh, the answer is 0.7. But if one of them is drawing on satellite reconnaissance and one of them is re re drawing on cyber code breaking and others drawing on human intelligence and so forth, they're drawing on different types of information and they're working in siloized compartments and haven't shared that yet, 
uh, then the, diff the, the point sevens mean something different. Uh, they mean that you're warranted in drawing a more extreme inference. So that, that was uh, an algorithm that was known as the extremizing algorithm in our work. Um, it, it meant that um, uh, point sevens often meant something more like point eight five, um, and that that, uh, that that actually improved both calibration and, and resolution and forecasting. Wow, that's so that's terrifically interesting. Um, so yeah, the people in this room, kind of, we want to have accurate beliefs because ultimately we just want to make the world better. We're altruistically motivated. Do you think there are right. special problems that arise for people who are motivated to try and do good when it comes to trying to form accurate beliefs? Well, I, again, I, as I said before, I think when people make forecasts, they have a lot of motives that come into play, and accuracy is often not the only one. In forecasting tournament, all that matters is accuracy. It doesn't matter if you under or overestimated the adversary or did this or that. All that matters in the tournament is accuracy. And it's, it, it, um, you're not lobbying for a particular um, organizational or ideological point of view. Um, you don't have any axe, axe to grind beyond accuracy. Um, in a similar vein, I suppose, in the philanthropic world, uh, you, you have multiple motives at work as well. I mean, I, I, I come from... Uh, uh, I was originally trained as a social psychologist. I got my PhD in 79. And back then, uh, many uh, psychologists were as materialistically utilitarian as economists were. Uh, and you told you use a term like altruism, and they'd look at you, and they'd roll their eyes a bit, and they'd say, well, it's kind of naive, isn't it? I, what do you mean by altruism? Like, what what, what, what self-interest is animating them? Um, and it, there, there are a lot of uh, arguments in the psychological literature that altruism is motivated by some kind of covert hedonism, a warm glow of satisfaction or guilt reduction, or, or also the more microeconomic or self-presentation literature is that people are engaged in virtue signaling. Uh, so these are all alternative um, things that people do. Um, how does that tie into forecasting? Well, if rigorous forecasting requires confronting morally uncomfortable thoughts that make it more difficult to feel good about yourself or that make it more difficult to engage in virtue signaling, then someone who is um, engaged in those things should find it harder to be a super forecaster uh, when it comes to philanthropic projects. Yeah, okay. So in what would your advice be then for the effective altruism community, both as individuals in that community and as a collective? insofar as we're trying to figure out what are the most important cause areas, what are the most effective programs that can be run, what things could we do in order to improve our rationality, our ability to make good predictions? One of the great challenges in forecasting tournaments that I see is still substantially unaddressed mm -hmm. is improving the quality of the questions. Forecasting tournaments can only be as interesting as the quality of the questions they're designed to answer. Um, and unfortunately, we haven't come up yet in the forecasting tournament research domain with uh, ways of running tournaments that uh, involve competitions to, to generate interesting questions mm. as well as uh, accurate answers. But we do need that. We need competitions to generate interesting questions. Uh, I think in one of the slides that, we, that, you, that you singled out as useful, I talked about one of these themes that uh, with, uh, at Davos, I think last year, called, called Fourth Industrial Revolution. And mm -hmm. I don't know if we could put that up or not, but uh, Fourth Industrial Revolution is a rather amorphous idea, um, and uh, it, it could mean a lot of things. Uh, but it's possible to take these very abstract concepts and decompose them into resolvable forecasting indicators. So we don't know whether or not there's going to be a Fourth Industrial Revolution that massively dislocates white-collar labor markets by 2040, uh, but we can, answer, we can pose as a forecasting tournament question whether there are driverless Uber cars in Las Vegas or Singapore or whatnot by the end of 2017 or uh, whether spending on robotics exceeds $200 billion by the year 2021, or uh, whether half the accounting jobs in the U.S. disappear by 2024. Um, so you can decompose these big, big concepts into resolve, resolvable indicators. And I think in a similar vein, you can uh, do that for some of the more difficult and politically morally uh, uncomfortable questions in the altruism domain. Uh, you can ask, for example, to borrow a phrase from one famous economist, um, how leaky is the aid bucket in country X? Uh, or you can ask questions that are tailored around interventions designed to uh, stop the spread of disease or to improve quality of schools and whatnot. Uh, but but the, the key thing is to um, uh, 
take a, a, a possible future that is reasonably far off and think of things that you would be likely to observe in the nearer term future if that future were going to materialize. Okay, so for something like is Against Malaria Foundation the best charity, you could break that down at least in part to some just empirical questions like will GiveWell recommend a charity with an estimated cost per life saved of less than $2,000 by 2009, let's, oh, sorry, 2020, let's say. Um, yeah. Or, you know, will Against Malaria Foundation receive at least $20 million by the end of 2016, that sort of thing. Um, I, I, I think that's right. And, and I, I think that uh, forecasting tournaments, I think, if you, if you want to persuade an organization to embrace forecasting tournaments, you need to persuade them that the tournaments will help them answer questions they care about. Otherwise, it devolves into trivial pursuits. Yeah. Well, that was the last question I... Think, I... Go on, sorry. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I'm being a little harsh on forecasting tournaments there. I, 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 trivial pursuits. I, I, I think that forecasting tournaments actually are useful if you value... Um, um, uh, your capacity for engaging in rigorous self-critical thought uh, as an end in itself. Uh, but if the goal is to use tournaments as a means to achieving other ends, like uh, stopping malaria, uh, then you need to um, organize the tournament around the, the right questions. Yeah. Okay, well, that yeah, brings me to my final question then, which is whether you think that the effective altruism community itself should try and run a forecasting tournament um, with some of these questions that we've mentioned. I mean, there's a lot of disagreement on things like timelines of robotics and artificial intelligence. There's lots of disagreements about um, some of these empirical questions relating to some of these top charities. Do you think that's something we should try and run? Is that feasible for us? Uh, short answer, yes. Uh, and you, you can do it in a couple of different ways. I mean, you, 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 if you have um, uh, an organization that has a reasonable amount of funding, you can set up your own internal forecasting tournament. And, and if you have a critical mass of staff, you can do it that way. Uh, or you can run it on a public forecasting tournament. Or in a prediction market, if you, if you I mean, there are different people have different preferences for tournaments versus prediction markets. And that's another technical literature. You know, if we had an hour or so, we could, we could talk about it. Uh, but some mechanism that requires people to um, uh, move beyond vague verbiage like distinct possibility and put themselves out on a limb and start learning from feedback. Wow, that'd be terrific. And it's like that we can post questions to the open, the, sorry, the Good Judgment Project website. Um, and then people from all around the world can start to contribute their estimates to those questions. Is that right? That's right. GJOpen.com is certainly one place where they could go. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you so much for joining us via Skype. Um, thanks for taking the time to answer these questions. It's been an absolute oh, delight my, to my, see you. My, my, my pleasure, Will, and my apologies again for not being able to be there in person. No, well, it's been an absolute pleasure. You're a personal hero of mine and I think many people in the room. So let's just have another round of applause to thank Phil again. Thank you.